We call them public advisors, although the people call them lived experience experts. But what are the true snakes and ladders of being involved in research? What is the lived experience of sharing your lived experience? And how do you get to do that on a daily basis? Here are some of the views of our public advisors. In this episode, we meet with Terry Bryant. My background is actually business, but that changed in recent years when I moved up here. And more recently, I've been a care EBE for my wife who has complex physical and mental health issues. So that's what I've been doing. And um, with a little bit more time on my hands, I've diversified to be involved with a whole variety of projects, most of them centered around mental health or health, and so trying to assist various bodies. Mike Trusseter from ARC Southwest Coast. I've recently retired from full-time work. I've mainly been involved most of this century in education in one form or another. Mainly, I was working on a University of Plymouth PGCE course, teaching PGCE. That's postgraduate certificate in education. I then moved into a community interest company, a charity, and worked on a project that was funded by the European Social Fund, which was encouraging people to get into higher education who traditionally didn't have what would be normally expected qualifications. But recently retired full-time in September. So now I work with HEPI, the Health, Environment and Public Engagement Group, when I went to university. Iram Durrani. I'm a public advisor with our Northwest Coast. I'm a co-lead for the implementation and capacity building team. And Phil Watson. I am currently in our house, which is round the corner from the world famous Penny Lane. If you're familiar with the Beatles song. So I live in Liverpool with my wife. We have two birth kids. We started fostering in 2011. And we adopted one of our foster kids. Some of the time, I'm a secondary school teacher. Some of the time, I promote fostering for Liverpool City Council. And when I've got any other spare time, I'm a public advisor. And I do one or two other things for some charities, mostly around child protection and adoption and fostering. Have you been involved in research before you became a public advisor with the ARC Southwest Coast? My involvement with research was initially from my work with the University of Liverpool, where I'm part of a team of experts by experience who support and assist the academics and also the trainees on that course. And part of the requirements is that trainees develop research proposals and discuss these and then move into the actual research. And experts by experience are, are both part of like a panel that hear their presentations and respond to that, and then also work closely with the trainees, helping them, bringing them down to ground sometimes, uh, giving them ideas, and assisting them in many ways, communicating with this very strange body of humanity called the general public. My main engagement with research was associated with my own education and then helping other people in education, but it's mainly been to do with qualitative rather than quantitative research. Why did you join ARC and how did you find out about it? So one of my friends, uh, Psychos, uh, she was a public advisor. She still is a public advisor with ARC. She joined ARC when ARC was Clark. She used to talk a lot about ARC and her role with ARC and all that. And I used to find it very interesting. So one day I just showed interest and I said to her, it looks very interesting and I would like to join it as well. So that's how I got involved. And at that time, I didn't exactly knew what being a public advisor entailed or what it meant. But I joined because from what I heard from her. It's pretty new to me. And as far as I can remember, and I probably should know better, I got approached by ARC or similar to say, could you do a presentation about fostering? Because it's my job and my passion. I went, absolutely. And so you approached me rather than the other way around as a kind of guest speaker. And then I got approached to become a public advisor. And that was probably not that long ago. We only took about six, eight months, something like that. What I've done of it, it's been great. 
I found out about it initially when one of my colleagues on the group that work at University of Liverpool said that she also was a member of ARC. So I Googled ARC, I read about it, and I was pretty much none the wiser at the end of it because I found it a slightly nebulous, <laughs> diffuse concept and organization generally. And then I had a couple of meetings and then I worked, which is what I really liked. I, I, I had a, well, there's a project that Katerina uh, kindly involved and myself and my wife with, and that grounded it, which is for me, that's where I come from. I, you know, research is is fantastic and wonderful, but unless it's actually grounded and has the means to have impact, then I kind of uh, lose a bit of interest, I guess, really. I just do. I just want to make a, a difference rather than just learn about stuff. Learn about stuff is fine, but it has to manifest into actually changing things. Well, through HEPI, really, and Exe University, the links are there. So, yeah, we keep making connections between other research initiatives and, and ideas of feeding back to researchers. And I think that's an important thing for me is to be able to give people an insight into how research is viewed by lay people and the people who are researched as well. A lot of different people will be listening and they don't know what a public advisor is. How does it look and feel to you as a public advisor? What's, what's it like for you in that role on a day-to-day -day basis? Public advice means that you're having a say in research or you're shaping, you're taking part in the design of research and you're shaping future health services or interventions. And there are many aspects to being a public advisor, sometimes you're asked to take part in a group discussion or sometimes you'll be asked to comment on a document or review a pro research proposal. Sometimes you'll be asked to either chair or facilitate a meeting it, or you know, attend a workshop and things like that. Or, or sometimes you'll be asked to join a committee or a selection board. So you're kind of giving your advisor or opinion as a critical friend. This is quite a personal one for me. What keeps you motivated and involved in art? It, it can sometimes be frustrating. What keeps me involved is I believe in it as a vehicle that can make a difference. It's not just a, a talking shop, although sometimes it, it does seem like that at times, but it's the, the belief that Things can change, things can happen, lives can be improved. And if any small way at all I can be involved and contribute to that objective, then I'm more than happy to, to do so. So it's that it's not just a research talking shop. It actually has real life, real time impact and value. I got involved three years ago. I, I really enjoy it. I feel like I'm making a difference and... I think that's why I enjoy it a lot. Because I'm from a South Asian background, I feel like I'm bringing in the perspective of my own community to the research table, which is very important. I feel if we don't take part in research, things are not going to improve for us. Dare I say it, it's good for my mental health to be challenged and intellectually stimulated. So I get a lot out of it. Are there any things that you find frustrating or demotivating? Sometimes I think it is treated a bit in a tokenistic way. I think public should genuinely influence decision-making or they need to have a role. But I sometimes I feel like it's a tick box for some research teams and I don't like that. Have you ever found your views being questioned or your involvement being questioned? Not overtly, but people I've encountered tend to fall into a a couple of groups. Generally, the, the reception for public advisors has been very open, very warm, uh, and, and very engaging, which is which is great. But there is this tendency, not just within ARC, but there's the machine of ARC and public advisors sort of hang off the side a little bit. And they need to be more integral and they need to be more involved and they need to be more utilized and used. Because one thing that is particular is that if you go to see a doctor, for example, that doctor will be medically trained to a certain level, as will all the other doctors. Whereas with public advisors, they bring to the table a whole raft of diverse experiences and knowledge, and that's a sort of reservoir pool 
of expertise that is, I think, barely tipped into. Do you feel your contribution as a public advisor are valued and what is the one thing that demonstrates to you that you are being appreciated? Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. So it depends on a research team. That's why your experience will differ from one project to another. But I feel appreciated when, like, I, I always think of it as how involved and how informed I am. Am I as informed and as involved as the rest of the team? And if the answer is yes, then I feel like my contributions have been appreciated and I've been valued in a project. It's a difficult one because having been on, the, again, the other side of the fence of having to give feedback, it's really difficult sometimes to sort of say anything that isn't just complimentary or encouraging to sort of carry on learning. But I think as public advisors, I think we have to be acknowledged that we're giving feedback from perspectives that aren't necessarily understood. So if if somebody comes straight out of medical school and they have a research proposal, you can give somebody feedback and they go, oh, yeah, thanks for that. But what are you going to do with it next? How will that change the way you're going to do things? Have you thought about doing it differently? Yes, I have. Where would you go for help to do it differently? Was my feedback useful to you? And if it wasn't, why not? Like, that all sounds so basic, doesn't it? What is your vision for equitable public involvement and engagement in health research? Oh, to make it so much easier for people to participate. It's difficult because I think people who would be attracted to engagement are going to be comfortable what, with what we're doing now, for example. And there are groups of people that I've worked with in my last job who would be put off by just the acronyms, the computers, everything about it. There'll, it'll be a barrier for them, to be quite honest. I mean, you know, when you're trying to encourage people to access something that they have little comprehension of, the basics are so important and yeah there's a, there's a load of barriers there there's loads of people i've worked with in the charity that sort of just would not come anywhere near what we're trying to do being able to talk to people if with some perceived version of authority feeling excluded not feeling part of a community how can we make that easier i think we have to think about having meetings where we encourage people to come along and meet and talk more freely about what concerns them in terms of health and engagement and levelling up. All of those things, instead of saying, this is what we want to talk about, be more um, open about the questions, what troubles you, and then perhaps develop the conversations to explore what people talk about in more detail, and then see if they map to what researchers think is important for groups of people. That sounds a bit clumsy, but it's sort of like, very, very light touch, conversational, takes a long time. That's the problem. Well, at a meeting yesterday with part of the British Psychological Society, what came out very loudly and clearly is that Britain is actually ahead of the field in this in terms of the involvement with public advisors. I'm going to Europe. I think that's fantastic. Great. But that's no excuse to rest on our laurels at all. I think that public advisors, a couple of things, public advisors not only have a unique perspective to offer and contribute to health services, which will enhance and improve them. Secondly, I think it's absolutely a requirement. The health services are about us. We are part of it. And so to try to road away that uh, them and us element. And the third aspect, I would say, is that public involvement and engagement is put into uh, law, is put into requirements from the NHS and etc., their requirements are there, but they're not all fully happening yet. So to see that, to make things happen and to persuade people of the value of public advice and public advisors and to work on that as, as long as I can. I think I would like to see increased diversity in public involvement and engagement. It's very important. And that public advisors treated more like equal partners. And they need to influence decision making in the true sense. Because sometimes I feel like there's a bit of power dynamics as well. I, I think that feedback is sometimes research teams will write how they've involved public. Then the public advisors will be sent those part of, you know, research proposals or what when they're designing research and public advisors will comment on it. But I feel like the funders need to have a direct contact 
with public advisors to ask for their feedback. Only then they'll get to know how genuine the involvement was. Because sometimes the research teams can write, yes, public was involved, attended meetings. But what was the quality of that involvement? Very important. I would aim high. That's that's really my message to Ark, to everything else. Aim high. Even if you don't, what's, what's the phrase sir, from the film? Aim for the stars, even if you get, don't get there. At least you'll make the moon. My lived experience of contributing to health research as a public advisor is very much similar and aligned to what Mike, Terry, Iram and Phil shared and suggested. If you want to hear more, look out for the full interview with each of our guests and make sure you follow hashtag implement equity if you don't want to miss them.